Ladies and gentlemen, it is your friend, Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you for standing by. I just had to uh, figure out some technical <laughs> technical difficulties. It wouldn't be an Ocean Liner Designs uh, live stream if there wasn't some kind of horrific technical problems, which is a classic. But good to see you all. Hello. Hello, hello. We've got a lot of people joining in. I just wanted to say hi to you all as you come in for a second. We've got AFOX from Ireland. Hello, AFOX. I've got uh, family in Ireland, my brother. Uh, lives over in Dublin, but he's moving back to Melbourne at the end of this year, which is very exciting. Brady, of course, being a very Irish surname. Uh, we've got quite a few people joining in. Um, Skittery Fiber wanted a shout out. Of course, he is uh, one of the Ocean Liner Designs patrons. Good to see you all. We've got Naval Guy watching from the Philippines. Hello, Naval Guy. Good to see you guys. Um, I've, I'm doing something a little different. I'm not wearing my uh, my waistcoat today. Because uh, it's spring, you know, things are getting a little warmer. Um, it's a little bit shocking. If this was the 19th century, I'd be in trouble, you know, because uh, the braces are considered like underwear um, in 19th century thinking. So this is maybe a little bit racy. So maybe don't show your kids this live stream. And in fact, that was the point of a waistcoat was to kind of obscure the um, the braces from, from view because they were really, in theory, underwear. But then as kind of like the decades went on, people stopped being so... Um, yeah, I guess so modest. <laughs> so I'm sorry if this is a little disturbing for some of you at home. <laughs> we got crazy Doctor Who saying hi from Chicago. Hey, hey, crazy. How you doing? Mr. Garrett wanted a shout out. Bismarck Hunter wanted a shout out. Bismarck Hunter. That's a good name. That would, in theory, make you the battleship HMS Nelson, I would assume. Or Rodney. Um, how are we all going? We got someone, uh, we got uh, Jacques Theron from South Africa saying hi. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. Mr. Garrett says, what ocean was the Lusitania sailing in? Uh, it sailed in a couple of um, seas. Mainly it was in the North Atlantic Ocean, but when she sunk, she was off uh, Ireland in the Irish Sea. I Am Boat is one of the uh, Ocean Liner Designs YouTube members. And he's got a little hat. You can see he says, hello, hello, I Am Boat. Good to see you all. Crucially, I have my coffee. So the more I drink of this, the more um, the more I'm going to be talking faster and get chattier. You know, I think um, I think this looks a lot better. I've invested in new lights and everything, so I wanted to look as as vibrant and realistic as possible. It's like I was sitting directly in front of you. <laughs> um, what I thought I'd do to start this um, to start this stream off. Uh, is talk a little bit about some of the videos that I've done the last couple of, of weeks and kind of like clear up some of the questions, I guess. A lot of people have got, I guess, um, there are similar comments coming through on some of the videos that I've done, especially the ones about Titanic, uh, because they're always popular. People love um, talking about the Titanic. So I just thought I'd run through what I've done. And um, if you guys have any questions on the videos... Maybe we can answer them here, but I'll just kind of like give you my headspace when I was making them since the last live stream and um, maybe like share some behind the scenes tidbits and kind of how I made them and why I made them. Um, someone says, what time is it for you? It's just gone eight o'clock in the morning, which is why I am um, absolutely demolishing this coffee. <laughs> so some of the videos that I've done the last couple of uh, weeks have you know, um, got lots of comment. One of them, probably the most, um, divisive one, I suppose would be what if Titanic hit the iceberg head on, would it have survived? And uh, a lot of people have been asking about, about this video. And before I get into this, actually, I just wanted to talk about why I make so many Titanic videos in the first place, because a lot of people comment, say things like, why, why another Titanic video or, um, you know, people aren't that interested in the Titanic. You know, it's been done to death. Why are you talking about it? Well, first of all, the numbers don't lie. People are 100% interested <laughs> in the Titanic. I get like, a, you know, 10 times more views per Titanic video than per uh, non-Titanic video. So Titanic is always big. Um, so that out of the way, that aside, to answer the, the first question, it's like when I was, for a little anecdote, when I was a a kid, I was just really fascinated in the Titanic, you know, it was just Titanic everything. And, um, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. You know, you just want to learn about the Titanic, maybe the Lusitania a little bit, but, um, the other ocean liners are maybe like secondary to, to that as a topic. But, um, through that, you know, I bought 
uh, the well, so I've got given the books um, Titanic the Ship Magnificent, which I've got here. Oh, coincidentally. <laughs> uh, which is a, a absolute tome of a book or a series. This is heavy. Um, but from reading those books, I got a good understanding of how Titanic was built. And the thing about the Titanic is that it wasn't very special in that um, Harlan and Wolf had a formula for building ships and they'd been doing it for decades. And Titanic was, to them, even though it was the largest ship in the world or the largest they'd built at that time, it was, it was following the formula, you know? So if you can understand how Titanic was built, you can understand how all ships before Titanic were largely built and how, <coughs> excuse me, how Harlan and Wolf's ships, you know, immediately post Titanic were built and operated. So that's why I do these videos like a guide to Titanic's flags. It's because if you can understand the flags that the Titanic carried and flew, then you can understand the flags that the Lusitania or the Mauritania or any, literally any other British merchant ship from the era flew because they all followed the same procedure. They're all built and operated in almost exactly the same way. Um, it's just a lot of the, the nuance around like how the ships um, were decorated and, you know, the, the captains and the crews that gave them each a bit of individual character. But for the most part, they were built very, very similarly to Titanic. So to that end, if I'm making videos about the Titanic, about, you know, its flags or about if Titanic could have survived the iceberg head on, then you can extrapolate that and say, well, you know, therefore, in theory, Mauritania or Lusitania could have probably survived some kind of encounter with an iceberg. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I haven't put too much thought into that. Maybe that's a future video topic. <laughs> Wicker says, play one of your dad's songs. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, my dad is a singer in Australia. Uh, so that's where that's coming from. Um, he's like a minor Australian celebrity. He plays, um, he's had a great career as a musician. Like he's, he's done some amazing stuff going back, you know, decades. Like he was a rock star in the sixties and seventies. And then, um, he wrote a, uh, an anthem for Australian football in the seventies that absolutely went off called Up There Kazali. That was like a number one selling hit in Australia. And he sings it every year at the Australian grand final, which is the equivalent of like the American Super Bowl in Australia. So, um, yeah, my dad's music is not bad. The naval guy, Mike, when will you be releasing the JVO Hawaiian shirt? <laughs> soon, soon. I know the JVO has become a meme <laughs> in, in my Discord server and in the Ocean Liner uh, designs community as a whole, the Johan van Alden Barneveld. I was devastated. The, the great big move, the YouTube channel, I was watching a video of his the other day, which was... Um, the, the top 10 ugliest ocean liners of all time. And really close to the top of the list was the Johan van Alden Barnevelt, which I think is an actual crime. It's, it's just outright, it's a lie. It's, a, it's not, definitely not, could not possibly rank up there as one of the most ugly ocean liners of all times. And I will, I will assert that she was beautiful. Did she have a lot of windows in weird places? Yes. <laughs> could the funnels have been a little bit taller? Maybe. <laughs> so um what I was uh I am boat says when will we make ocean man merch yeah I've become a meme uh I was going to show it in the stream but I'm going to try to keep the tone a little bit more professional we'll find a way I'll find a way for you to share the ocean man meme with you guys it was made by someone in the discord server it's very funny Okay, so just going back to my original train of thought, keep the questions coming because I'll try and uh, try and answer them as they come through. Oh, the Bell Life Short says, love the channel, bro. You do a fabulous job with it. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining. Really appreciate it. Okay, could Titanic have survived an iceberg head on? So, um, look, I'm not a naval architect. I'm not a maritime engineer and um, very few YouTubers actually are. So um, I'm an enthusiast. My background is in industrial design, which was where I did my honors project. I am a illustrator and I'm interested in ships and I've been interested in them a long time. But, um, you know, I'm not a maritime architect. So that's why in this video, I relied on, uh, you know, papers, engineering papers that have been written by naval architects and engineers talking about um, the crumpling effect of, of ships colliding with objects head on. 
Now, since I released that video, another popular ship YouTuber has uh, released a video essentially um, arguing the, the counterpoint that no, Titanic would not have survived and actually repeating a few of the, the, um, the, the things that I build as myths in my video, that there would have been a pressure wave that would have popped rivets all the way up the hull. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, again, totally fine. It's just a matter of opinion. It's a purely a hypothetical. But the reason I made this what if Titanic could have, you know, hit the iceberg head on survived video is it's a good vehicle to learn about what kinds of things ocean liners in the early 20th century were designed to handle and, you know, the, some of the engineering behind it. I mean, I'm still convinced that, yes, Titanic could have survived the iceberg uh, in a head-on situation. And a lot of the comments said, what if, um, you know, Titanic hit the iceberg head-on? You mentioned the Arizona. Uh, you mentioned the Grampian, which are two other ships that, that hit the iceberg bow, bow on. Um, but they were much smaller and they were going a lot slower. But in the video, I specifically mention uh, Shen Ming Zhang's paper, where he draws a correlation between the amount of steel used in a ship's construction and its ability to mitigate the impact force of a collision event. So, yes, Titanic was bigger and faster than the Grampian and the Arizona, but it was bigger and therefore more steel was employed in its construction. More steel was in that crumple zone, if you will, at the bow of the, at the, bow of the ship. So because there is that direct correlation, it means that Titanic itself, the bow crumpling would have been able to mitigate more force than the bow of the Arizona or the, the Grampian. So and one of the examples in that paper is of a 150,000 dead weight ton tanker doing 18 knots into a wall. Um, and he explains that the ship would lose a certain amount of, um, of bow in that collision event. Uh, I forget exactly how much it was, but I, I linked these papers in the in the bottom, and um, of the bottom of the video description. People were commenting and saying, "I believe that it wouldn't have happened," or it's it's just interesting. I'm not I'm not saying that I'm the absolute authority in any subject ever, but I do try and back up my argument with with some you know some some engineering evidence and historical evidence. Is why I linked that that paper. So, um, yeah, I recommend reading it. It's a really interesting paper. It's about 240 pages, but a lot of it is mathematical formulas. So you don't need to like pour through it, but it's, it's worth having a look. Um, so yeah, I still believe I hear your comments and I think it is a hypothetical, you know, I can't, no one can say for absolute certainty. I framed it as, yeah, it probably could have survived based on the engineering and the history and the, and the physics. Um, but who knows really? I mean, anything could happen, you know, I just, I think it's more likely it could have survived. Ballistic Mallard says, do you wear your YouTube uniform like that for your everyday clothes? It's actually a really good question. I did. I did once uh, for about five years. I dressed every day. <laughs> I just got a really funny text from my, from my girlfriend who is watching this stream and is bound to leave some kind of funny comment at some point uh, laughing at this exact question. Do you, do you wear these clothes? <laughs> Hello, darling. <laughs> I did for a while for about five years I dressed every day um like it was the Edwardian era for want of a better term because it was just fun I don't know it was like a hobby that I could that I could enjoy and live and so everywhere I would go I'd have some kind of hat so um not like your corner store fedora type thing but I'd you know in summer you wear a straw boat a hat because it's because it's summer and actually funnily enough in um this is an interesting one for you guys. It's like a historical point. Hat wearing was taken very, very seriously in the early 20th century, as you guys know. The type of hat that you wore was even more important. In summer, usually you had the choice of a straw hat, like a boater hat, which is one of those flat um, straw hats with a, like a ribbon, or a, or a fur hat, which is maybe like a bowler or one of those... One of those um, any of those hats, a fedora, a Homburg hat, any of those types of fur hats. And um, in, in autumn and winter, you couldn't wear a straw hat. It was just not the done thing. You, would, you had to take your boater hat off and it was something of a tradition to like put your, you know, punch it and destroy that hat and get a new one in the, in the next spring. But I think it was the early 20s, maybe like 1921 or 1922. Um, you know, standards had relaxed a little bit. 
And people were were not so, you know, crazy about it anymore, or a few weren't. And so in autumn of that year, in New York City, a bunch of fellas were walking around wearing boater hats in autumn. And it's it started an actual riot. I think it was called the Hat Riot. And there's a Wikipedia page on it, and there were dozens of injuries, and there were people running around with sticks, knocking people over the head to get their hats off. And it was this whole thing. Dozens of people seriously hurt. It's fascinating. Um Imagine people caring about uh, about that in today's society. I don't see like a a correlation in in modern society. So anyway, yes, I did used to wear clothes like this every day. Um, I wear them on my channel because um, people seem to enjoy it. Again, it's like an opportunity for me to do my hobby a bit more. I just noticed my tie is not totally straight. Um, to you know, do my hobby some more and and just have some fun with it, which is great. Um, so good question. Angel says, I've seen your alternate history videos. They sent a super chat for $10. Thank you so much, Angel. That's fantastic. Really appreciate it. I've seen your uh, alternative history videos on Titanic and Britannic. Can you do one on the proposed fourth Olympic class that was to replace Titanic, but was never built to the out due to the outbreak of uh, World War I? Yeah, I'm interested in this one um, because there was... Uh, a, a, a White Star Line had this problem in that they needed a, a three-ship... Uh, lineup to continue regular service. I mean, ships and ocean liners are really, really similar and not not at all um, too dissimilar to like airliners, the way that aircraft companies work, because by their very nature, you've got machines going one way and machines coming the other way. So Cunard, their rival company, figured this out early on as well when they built these two super liners early on, about 1903 through 1906. There was the Lusitania and the Mauritania, you have two ships, one at New York, one at uh, Liverpool, going backwards and forwards. And so they would basically cross mid-ocean. Um, and that makes perfect sense because as a company, you can carry you know 2,000 passengers one way and 2,000 passengers the other way at the exact same time. But if one of your ships, one of your superliners is in for refit or gets delayed or anything like that, then the service is kind of either ground to a halt or they have smaller ships that aren't so much their premium option um, and so you've got a you've got a problem. So there needed to be a third superliner. And in uh, the Cunard Lines case, they retroactively realized this and then built and launched a much larger ship later on in 1914 called the Aquitania, which I mentioned in a lot of my videos. And that was meant to be the third part of this arrangement. The Olympic class were designed outright to be a three class, a three ship class: Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic. There would be operating probably two ships going from um, New York to Southampton, and then the third ship either doing that part of the voyage, either one or maybe mid ocean or or in for refit, and just cycle through them. It makes perfect sense. You can have a regular, reliable service. In the days before aeroplanes, you had to know that you know what I can get back to Southampton. On Wednesday, say, for example, every uh, second Wednesday or every third Wednesday, I know that I'll be able to go back and make my business meetings the next week. So businessmen and holidaymakers, they still needed that regular service that you get from airplanes. Nowadays, of course, back then it was ships. So a third ship was needed. And when Titanic was lost, that all went out the window for the White Star Line because suddenly they have a two ship lineup. And the whole point has been kind of defeated. So in the immediate wake of Titanic's loss, um, obviously they invested in Britannic, which was the third sister, completely overhauled the design, and then Britannic sank in the First World War. So emerging from 1918 into 1920, the White Star Line is in a bit of a sticky spot because they haven't got this, you know, now they've only got one superliner. So it's even it's gone even worse for them than, than it could have possibly been imagined before the war. So yeah, there were plans to introduce a superliner to replace either Titanic or Britannic. And I, I have seen early sketches and I'm not exactly sure about the validity of these, but there was a uh, four funnel Olympic class looking ship. So it looks like a, a bigger Titanic. I call it the super Titanic, or it's got a uh, cruiser stern, which is a different kind of stern design than the original ships had. It's a little more modern. Uh, it looks like the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary had that kind of stern. And a couple of small changes, but they just upped the tonnage and made it a much bigger ship. And um, I think that concept then evolved into this idea of a of a three funneled motor vessel, which was a, a real you know nineteen twenties concept, um, diesel powered, 
three squat funnels and just a massive, massive ship. So a lot bigger than the Titanic. Um, and they actually did start building that ship, but it was scrapped. And in theory, it would have been called the Oceanic, which was a name that the White Star Line had a strong connection with because that company was was really called the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company. The White Star Line was just their trading name. So there you go. That was a, a long, drawn-out <laughs> way of saying that there was going to be a superliner, some kind of fourth Olympic-class um, super ship. So to answer your original question, Angel, uh, yeah, I will do another White Star Line um, what if. I might do something on a fourth Olympic class ship in the future, but that's that's really out there hypothetical because, um, you know, it, it didn't happen at all versus like, what if Britannic didn't sink? Well, that mine could have been inert, you know what I mean? And it could have bounced off the side of the ship and Britannic could have survived. So I'd really have to be flexing my imagination for the, for the fourth Olympic class ship. Um, my... Olympic class alternative what if to complete that trilogy of videos. The third one is what if Olympic wasn't scrapped and uh, my, my idea is to have it be bought by the Nazi party as a propaganda vehicle and renamed and then turned into a floating anti-aircraft gun platform during the Second World War where it is sunk by Avro Lancaster bombers because it is defending the German battleship Tirpitz, which is completely insane, but I just thought it would be. A little bit of fun, because I'm also a big World War II history nerd. I don't know if you guys know this, but I really do love my World War II history. A um, lot of good questions coming through. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I talk a lot, and then I look down at the comments, and then I look back up, and I keep talking, and then I look back down, and a lot of the questions have moved on. Uh, we did have someone just join the Ocean Liner Designs uh, YouTube membership program. Uh, Morty Carlos, welcome aboard. Good to have you as a member. Cheers to you. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can press join and you too will become an Ocean Liner Designs crew member and get early access to my videos and my stupid bloopers. No matter how hard I work on these videos and no matter how more often I make them, I still can't get a, a line out first time every time. <laughs> it's so difficult. <laughs> oh, practice makes perfect. It's only been a year of making these videos. Still, I still, I can't do it. I'm so bad with, with lines. It's hilarious. Uh, so, um, oh, Andy Happy Guy um, asked about my, my uh, what if Britannic didn't sing video. Let's talk about that video. Yeah, that was a fun one. That was a fun one. I really enjoyed making that video because I got to really, you know, kind of make it up. Um, because a lot of people ask, you know, where, where does the real history end? And where does the fiction begin in my alternate history videos? So I've done what if Titanic didn't sink and what if Britannic didn't sink in 1916. And I'm going to make a, if you would be interested in this, like a little commentary video of me just kind of talking through, okay, well, this is, this is, you know, where the, the fiction comes in, but this is what the fiction is based on. And this is why I make alternate reality videos in the first place is, first of all, it's fun because I get to like, play a little bit faster loose with history. It still takes a lot of research to make them because I don't just make it up. The, um, the stories of these ships are based on real ships, but the names are changed to either Titanic or Britannic or Resolute, depending on what's going on. So for example, what if Titanic didn't sink? I had Titanic turn into like the middle child that isn't really that popular or famous and then gets into a lot of crashes and gets scrapped early. And that's the end of the story. A real, like, you know, fizzle ending for the Titanic, the greatest ship of all time. That's based on a P&O liner called the Iberia, uh, which was, like, the, one of the most beautiful ships P&O ever built uh, post-World War II in the 1940s and 50s. But it just never quite got to the same level of, of hype as its sister ships and running mates, you know, the, the um, Chusan, the Himalaya and uh, the Arcadia, for example. It just never quite got there and it kept getting into collisions and having breakdowns. And it was the last one to be built, but the first one to be scrapped. And so I basically ported that over for the, you know, the Titanic um, alternate reality. The Britannic alternate reality was very clearly based on the Aquitania. So the Aquitania, basically everything Britannic did in that story Aquitania did, except it survived World War II, which is incredible. So this ship that was like, you know, 40 years old, 
um, just kept on going. It was meant to be scrapped before the war, but it's, it pulled through. The thing of um, Britannic being renamed by the Admiralty was based on the Majestic, which I also mentioned in that video. It was a white Starline ship. And it was, um, it was renamed when she was bought by the British Admiralty, uh, renamed the Caledonian, I believe. So this was a thing. Um, but the British Admiralty bought it as a training ship to tr teach its crew how to, how to ship, <laughs> for want of a better term. <laughs> so, uh, how, how do I ship? So the, yes, the Majestic survived through to the Second World War as a training ship, but she was scrapped in, in 1942. So again, they're all based on real stories, uh, but just, you know, altered and, and kind of making it up as I, I go in some areas. Sometimes I can't help myself. Tyler Rowe, the Caledonia. Yes, thank you. Uh, we had crazy Doctor Who join the Ocean Liner Designs membership program. Good to have you on the crew, my friend. Welcome aboard. Raise of the coffee mug to you. What else we got going on? We have a five pound super chat from Ranossian. Ranossian. I hope I said that right. What would the history have been like if California had uh, woken their Morse operator, realized Titanic was in trouble and went to rescue them? A really good question. Uh, it's one that's been asked fairly frequently. But what, one thing that's often overlooked about the Californian is they were stopped for the night and um, ships from that era, you can't just fire up and get moving straight away. So they would have had some boilers running to generate the steam for the generators and the electricity so they could use their Morse if they needed, have some lights running and that kind of thing. But I would be very, very surprised if they were stoking their main boilers required to actually supply steam to the ship or enough boilers to supply steam to the ship for the engines to turn. And boilers take about six to eight hours, depending, to actually heat up um, and generate enough steam to move the ship. So Britannic... Uh, so Britannic. So I'm still thinking about Britannic. California was immobile. Say, for example, they did have enough um, head of steam built up or they did have those main um, boilers burning and creating steam. They then have a very tricky job of uh, turning their ship around in an ice field. They had stopped for the night and um, somehow picking their way through the, the, the night to get to Titanic. So they would have had a really tough job of it. I guess the point is they should have, they should have tried. You know, I think that's why the public was so outraged that uh, there should have been some curiosity aroused when they saw the rockets being fired. For context, Californian um, was was fairly close to the Titanic sinking. They they saw the Titanic sinking. They they said they saw a mysterious ship on the horizon. Um, they saw all the, you know lights on the horizon. They tried raising it with their Morse lamp, but they got nothing. The captain had gone to bed. The wireless operator on the Californian had gone to bed, so their set was off. And um, the, the crew on watch that night watched it. They saw rockets being fired up, but they assumed they were either company signals or um, the ship was trying to light the way through the ice field. And then they watched it go over the horizon, disappear over the horizon. And they, they didn't do anything about it from then. And it didn't disappear over the horizon. It actually sunk. So it's a, it's a tough one. I don't think they would have had an easy job of getting there if they could have. I don't think that ship was going anywhere for at least four or five or six hours because their boilers were probably shut down for the night. So the history may not have been all that different. Kaiser Wilhelm II says, Queen Mary Part 3 when also Lusitania game. I'm not even going to say that word because it's not. The Lusitania game is trucking along just fine. So nice try, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Sneaky Kaiser, up to your tricks again. Always. Was scuttling your navy at Scapa Flow not enough, Kaiser? You had to just try and cause panic in the Ocean Liner Designs community. Queen, there will be a Queen Mary Part 3 video, for sure. It's going to talk about Queen Mary and the Normandy battling each other for... This was super cool. If you love uh, drag races and, like, you know, car races, then Ocean Liner races are just as cool, right? you got something like the size of a city doing crazy amounts of speed. Um, I think it's real cool that uh that ever happened <laughs> so yeah there was a whole rivalry between normandy and the queen mary one that the queen mary won 
and and not through any uh revolutionary hull design or anything like that because her hull was horrifically inefficient i don't want to trigger any any of the uh queen mary fanboys and the fanboys and fangirls in the group in the chat here but she had a wedged shaped bow and uh generated one hell of a bow wave when she was going at full speed which is remarkably inefficient but the ship had unbelievably powerful uh, steam turbine engines, whereas Normandy was turbo electric and uh, just didn't quite have the, the grunt that Queen Mary did. So Queen Mary was just hammering her way through the ocean um, at insane speed through sheer power, the sheer force of these engines. Chick Vicious, hello Chick, how are you? Good to see you. Um, all the ships need love too, this is true. Uh, any plans to do a Great Eastern video? Yeah, I want to do... I want to do every video on every ship. <laughs> no, I do. I do have um, plans to do some stuff on the Great Eastern because it's just fascinating that um, this engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, was a, was a railway engineer from, I think, I don't think he was from Bristol, but he, he uh, built lines, you know, famously to Bristol and built this like insane railway bridges and um, just a fascinating character. And then he just applied those engineering principles to building ships and, you know, built a couple of them, the Great Western, the Great Britain, and his biggest and most famous was the Great Eastern. Um, famously a flop, but it was designed to come to Australia as an immigrant ship in an era where it was like a six month plus voyage by sail. And this thing is a big paddle steamer could have done it a lot quicker. Um, by far the largest ship in the world. I mean, it was just an incredible engineering marvel. Actually, I want to put a pin in this conversation and come back to it in a second um, because people have been talking about airships a lot, like the R101, which is a British airship, type of, you know, Zeppelin, and the Graf Zeppelin and the Hindenburg, very famously. Now, I'm really interested in airships and anything that fly, anything that flies. Sorry, not enough coffee to improve my grammar yet. So um, I was thinking of doing some videos on, uh, on, on airships. And maybe like diversifying the channel a little bit because I love technology and engineering as much as anyone. Um, beyond just ships, I think airships are just as interesting. We have to mel uh, we have to welcome uh, Josh Harford to the Ocean Liner Designs crew. Welcome, he's just joined as a member. Good to have you, Josh. Thanks for joining. Somebody asked when you saw the Baragula sinking, what did you think? I thought, ah, how disappointing. So much could have been done, you know, it's, it's a little bit like uh, the United States. There are always well-meaning parties behind the scenes trying to do their best to, um, to get the, the ship, you know, attention, but often it's so difficult. Fantastic news, though, in the last week, the um, battleship Texas was just uh, floated out. She's going for cons serious conservation work, which is brilliant, um, because often ships like that are just kind of left to, left to rot. So, no, that, that's fantastic news that the Texas is going to survive. When I saw the Baragula sinking, I thought, gee, uh, this did not need to happen. It's really sad. She was like a beautiful, beautiful ship. Stunning timber work on the inside as well. Really like a classic ship. Look up uh, SS Baragula interior on Google Images and you'll see what I mean. And uh, a lot of those beautiful little carved handrails and banisters and staircases and things when I went to go and see the wreck uh, a couple of weeks later, we're just, we're just floating around, all torn up. And it's amazing. It really shows you the destructive power of a ship sinking. Everything, it's like a its like a mincer in there. If it's not flooded slowly, as water pours in, everything just gets ripped up. And um, yeah, it is, it's like, a, it's like a, a blender, really. Everything gets torn around and, you know, everything that floats will float very quickly. And I'm, I'm fairly certain, actually, in a number of ship sinkings, there have been people killed by debris rocketing to the surface like lifeboats or anything designed to float um they just come up from below and they'll knock you out they'll kill you uh which is not what you would think of when you uh have survived a ship sinking um something coming up and anyone with thalassophobia or, or fear of water is probably sweating right now <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> ariel ballet ariel ballet says uss texas is also being rearmed and we'll show everyone why you should be afraid of Texas. <laughs> Excellent. We love to hear it. Okay, the, the USS Texas is being rearmed. The guns are being brought back to life. 
How many guns? Was she, uh, I, someone correct me if I'm wrong. Was it 15 inch guns? I forget. Two, four, six, eight, eight or 10, 15 inch guns off the top of my head or 14 inch guns. Let me know in the comments. Ah, there's so many, so many uh, good comments to keep up with. Morty Carlos, hello, and also welcome again to the channel. Good to have you as a member. Says, SS Great Britain. And a super chat. Yes, SS Great Britain. I'd love to go there. The SS Great Britain has been preserved. And um, stunning ship. I mean, absolutely beautiful. Uh, um, if you haven't seen the Great Britain before, have a quick Google image search for the SS Great Britain. Stunning looking, um, looking ship. And we're very lucky to have the ship still around. So yeah, no, I'd love to go and, and, and see the Great Britain do a video on, maybe it'll be like a whole Kingdom Brunel, the engineer, um, series of videos where we talk about his years in rail and then into ships all the way through. I'd love to do that. He, the guy deserves so much interest and attention because he was so, uh, so genius, just engineering genius. I just find it fascinating. Uh, okay, brilliant. So the USS Texas had 14 inch guns. Thank you guys. My <laughs> very often the audience knows more about what I'm talking about than I do. <laughs> 356 millimeter guns. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Crazy doctor. Appreciate it. So we've talked about the two videos that I've done. Uh, what if Titanic hit the iceberg head on and what if, uh, the Britannic didn't sink in 1916, the Lloyd Triestino video, uh, what how they, what, what if, I'm still caught up in the what if thing. What if Lloyd Triestino rebuilt, they did rebuild their ships. And um, the Lloyd Triestino video I want to do for ages. Like I find that shipping line so interesting. How they can have a, a tugboat like the Toscana and then, you know, not 15 years later be operating ships as like beautiful and modern and new as the Australia and the Oceania and the Neptunia and then hit the very peak with the Galileo Galilei and Guglielmo Marconi, her like identical sister ship, at the exact time that the jetliner comes in and ruins everything for the shipping trade is just such a like tragedy, but a story of brilliance. And then tragedy again, because they've built these stunning ships, but, but uh, you know, right at the, the wrong moment. Really makes you think, what would the world look like, the world of shipping now look like if aircraft hadn't really taken off as the, <laughs> pardon the fun. That was a good one. The aircraft hadn't really taken off as the predominant means of travel. Uh, what would the ocean liner look like today? Because I don't know if it would look like the Queen Mary 2. The Queen Mary 2 is an ocean liner by design, but she's been predominantly designed for, you know, pleasure cruising. I wonder what a ship built... <laughs> if we had the United States' technology in the 50s, we can get a ship that big moving at 40 knots, 38 knots. Imagine what we could do now. Would the answer be smaller liners with crazy, crazy turbine engines doing crazy speed? But could you turn it into like a three-day crossing? You know what I mean? Like a weekend crossing uh, to, um, to New York from Southampton or Liverpool? I don't know. Um, Caleb McFarlane says, hello, I love your work. Do you have any comment on Titanic Animation's video on the Titanic head-on crash? Pretty much going against your video. Yeah, I actually just mentioned this earlier. <clears throat> I, um, I like Titanic Animation stuff. He's a brilliant animator. Um, I've actually been following his channel for ages before I got into YouTube. Um, yeah, I think, um, look, I, I disagree with him. I, I disagree with his, with his video. Um, but that's okay. You know, I, I don't, I'm not, it's not a, you know, anything personal. I, I think he's quite analytical in the way he talks about a lot of the subjects. Um, I think obviously trying to be diplomatic here and not sound like I'm causing some kind of beef in the ocean liner community. Cause the guy's great. You know, I'm not, I'm not ragging on him at all, but my, my video, I think the point of it was missed a lot that I, I mentioned earlier, you know, that this, this, these physics scale just because Titanic was bigger than the SS Arizona just enhances the effect of bow crushing on impact because I, I mentioned it. It's, I cannot emphasize the point enough that because there is a correlation between the amount of steel involved in the construction of a ship, people saying, yeah, but the Titanic was bigger and it was going faster. Yes, it was bigger. That's, that's the point. There was more steel used. So the Titanic's bow could absorb more crushing force, um, or more impact force through crushing. 
but I again, I just wanted to point out that I'm I'm not a maritime engineer. I'm not a naval architect. I'm not a physics student or professor. Um, neither is Titanic Animations, as far as I'm aware. So, you know, I will fall back on people who are those things. So I linked papers in the video description. I, I referenced those papers. There's a lot written about ship collisions that I've researched and read before I made that video. Um, not everything, but I did my best. So I try and ground it in as much reality as I can rather than pure hypothetical postulating, which I feel like a lot of the comments did, which is, well, I think that Titanic would have exploded on impact. And one of the things that we've kind of, I've been laughing about with some friends is a lot of comments saying that, oh, Titanic would have, there would have been serious damage, which is true, but there would have been horrific injuries on board and a lot of people would have died from the ship coming to a stop that they think people would have, you know, collided with walls and, you know, in all fairness, uh, if you were standing near to the collision impacts, impact point, you fell down some stairs, you might be in some trouble. And I fell down some stairs the other day. Um, and that's another story that I'll tell you in a second. But the ship was doing 40 kilometers per hour. <laughs> the ship was doing 21 knots, thereabouts, 20, 21 knots. It's about 40 kilometers per hour. I don't know what that is in miles per hour. What is that like 20 or less? Um, you know, like, okay, yeah, you might hit a bulkhead and you might be a bit bruised, but there's not going to be like people, you know, red misting on impact on the inside of the ship. Like it's not doing, you know, 200 kilometers per hour, guys. Uh, so <laughs> anyways, again, I go on a tangent. Live streams are tricky. I was telling my girlfriend this the other day. Live streams are hard because you got to keep you can't have dead air. You have to just keep talking, basically. So this is why I talk myself into tangents, because I just keep talking. Because you have to, because I can't just go silent on you guys. You'd all stop watching. <laughs> mm. So yeah, there you go. That's why um That's why I think, you know, my 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 opinion, that's what it is, it is opinion, um, is more likely. But uh no, I, I hear valid points in Titanic Animations video. Go watch it if you're interested. Um I disagree with him. But, uh, you know, it's only based on the fact that I, I've i read all these, you know, engineering papers and they just led me to a different conclusion. And that's totally fine. Uh, Snow Speeders and Space Shuttles has donated five pounds through Super Chat. Thank you very much. He says, do you think that if the Germans bought Olympic, that maybe it could be sitting today like the SS United States, rusting in an Argentinian port? <laughs> that's awesome. I like that alternate history better than mine, which has the Olympic being sunk by a Avro Lancaster's bomb, like a tall boy bomb going right through the middle of it. That's funny. In Argentina. Amazing. No, I don't think it would have survived, unfortunately. One of the questions that often gets asked is, uh, in any video that I do is, or not even a question, it's a complaint. People complain about this. I made a Titanic video, what if Titanic didn't sink, and made what if Britannic didn't sink in 1916. People commented the same thing. They say, this video was okay, which cracks me up. This video was okay, but I disagree. I think the Titanic would have become a floating museum ship like the Queen Mary, or I think the Britannic would have become a floating museum ship like the Queen Mary, and today have survived. But the British just didn't do that. The British didn't care, especially post-World War One, and even more so post-World War Two. The British had these little things called austerity measures that are well worth reading into, where even though Britain was on the winning side of the First and the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War, they still had to implement rationing plans to the people of Great Britain because they had no food and their economy was absolutely wrecked. And um, that's actually why my family moved to Australia, is my granddad, who was a, a from Ireland originally, but he joined the British Army, which was contentious, and fought with the Leicestershire Regiment at Normandy. He was a veteran. Could not find a job when he came back, was living in London. And um, basically lived like a pauper. Like, imagine Charles Dickens, you know, very Dickensian existence in London, shoveling coal off the railway in um, their worst winter ever, which is like 1946, 1947. Um, I've got a, a picture of him in, like, basically... A, uh, a chain gang, you know, shoveling coal off the railway and he's in his old army coat. It's just absolutely tragic. You know, there's no, like, Department of Veterans Affairs for these guys or anything. And um, they were living in squalor, basically. 
Britain did not care about its ships or its historic ships or its its warships or anything like that. So they just started scrapping them. And if any ship should have been preserved at, from any point of British history, it was the battleship HMS Warspite. Warspite should have been kept. She had an un, just incredible amount of history. If you look that shit up, sh- ship up. <laughs> if you look that ship up. <laughs> oh no. I, did, I, I always thought I would accidentally swear on a live stream. But I always thought it would be me intentionally trying to swear to say a bad word without remembering that I'm on a live stream. That was an accident. I meant to say, look that ship up. Oh boy. If you look the, sh- the HMS War Spite up on Wikipedia, I'm just waiting for the chat to go insane from that one. Yep, there it goes. There it goes. Oh. <laughs> well, this has been a wonderful uh, live stream, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you all again next week. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, no. The comments. I'm never going to live that down. Oh. Oh, thank you. I've finally reached meme immortality. Brilliant. I look forward to seeing that uploaded somewhere on YouTube in the near future. If you're watching this in the future, hello, YouTube. So anyway, as I was saying, (laughs) Jim says I'm excused. It's a tongue twister. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I I agree. If you look up the War Spite on Wikipedia, you'll see that the War Spite had unbelievable... Uh, service career in history and the british scrapped her they scrapped everything there was a um the ship that had survived uh it was originally a french warship in the napoleonic wars i forget its name it wasn't the temeraire someone remind me of this um had fallen into disrepair a beautiful old man of war like um the hms victory one of those big sailing ships with you know two or three decks of guns beautiful thing and the british um, had this ship and had had it for decades, based centuries, really. It had been, a, 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 I think, a hulk and then a training ship and all this kind of thing. And they didn't know what to do with it, so they offered to give it back to France. This is in the, like about 1948-ish. They offered to give it back to France. The French didn't want it. And so the British government towed it out to sea and scuttled it and sank it. It was like a 200-year-old warship, and they just sank it because they didn't have the money to restore it. So if Britannic or Titanic or Olympic had survived in British hands until the 30s and 40s or post-war, they were getting scrapped. Um, There was no emotional attachment. There was almost as much emotional attachment to these things as we afford airliners nowadays. And enthusiasts are very sad to see the Boeing 747 pulled from service and scrapped. But the government doesn't think that way. They really don't care. The shipping lines, yes, they have a nice attachment. It's all all very nice, but they're very, very practical and pragmatic about these things. We look at them with a degree of romance nowadays, um, and and we we kind of like romanticize that era. Of course, of course, we do. It was, there was very nice parts of that era, and the whole nostalgia around ship travel. But um, business comes first. You know, and they, these things are expensive. Ask anyone involved with the Texas or the, you know, Queen Mary or any of those ships. And, you know, even the paint, the amount of paint required every year just to keep these things from from falling apart is just mind blowing. The um, the the Victory ship Lane Victory that I've had a, a little bit to do with and and drew the ship for them and um, she's in uh, California. St. Pedro, I believe. Stunning thing. But they they spent an absolute fortune on just painting that ship. But uh, if you're in the California area or San Pedro, I'm not exactly familiar with my geography from, from around there. It's near Long Beach. I know that. Um, go and have a look at the Lane Victory. They've got all her winches are working. She can hoist cargo aboard. And they're actually making her seaworthy, which is crazy cool. And uh, here's a little fact for you. In the movie Titanic, when there is the shot looking back at Ireland um, before the, you know, the uh, very famous ode to Titanic scene, with, I'm king of the world, that part, there's a shot with the ship's wake. That's actually the wake of the Lane Victory when she was still ocean going in the 90s. Uh, so that ship is a movie star. And I think it was also in, 
either Letters from Iwo Jima or The Pacific. One of those films. I think it was Letters from Iwo Jima. Or uh, Flags of Our Fathers. Sorry, I get those two mixed up. One of those World War II films. So go check out The Lean Victory. Why was the HMS, Victor, uh, HMS Belfast sorry, one of the only World War II ships that was spared from the scrappers? Yeah, the Belfast um, is an interesting one because uh, it's good that one snuck through. And in even the First World War, we had uh, HMS Caroline that was a, a veteran of the Battle of Jutland and is now, I think, the only surviving veteran of the Battle of Jutland that was spared the scrapyard because she was basically a floating, not barracks, but a floating officer's quarters. Um, Belfast, I'm pretty sure, was kept on as a training ship for a long time. And it's the training ships that survive the longest. And um, it's the same down here in Australia. We Near me, there's a beautiful Second World War corvette called um, the HMAS Castlemaine, which is a veteran of combat, almost sunk. And I'm doing a video on this ship because the story is actually unbelievable. She should have been sunk, but at the last minute she swapped places with her identical sister, Armadale, um, there was a decision that had to be made on which ship stays behind to take on these refugees in a war zone in the Pacific, which ship stays behind to take on um, the POWs, also, not POWs, but um, ragtag, ragtag military group that had been left behind. We had to evacuate them and also take these civilians away. And there was a mix up and the wrong ship took the civilians and the, and the, the Armadale ended up having to stay behind and take on these, these um, you know, bedraggled military guys. And so the captain of, of um, Castlemaine said, well, you know, we've got all these civilians on board now. We were meant to stay behind, but now we'll have to go back as fast as possible. So we'll meet you back at back in Queensland, Australia. So Armadale stayed behind and basically she got hunted down by Japanese aircraft and destroyed in this insane engagement where there was this young um, Tasmanian lad named uh, Teddy Sheehan who as this ship is being strafed from the air and the Japanese aircraft were circling back to machine gun survivors and um, put holes in lifeboats and that whole thing, he had strapped himself to this Olicon cannon, um, 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, and was just firing at them and knocked a couple of Japanese aircraft out of the sky, like shot a couple down, I'm pretty sure, at least one, and went down with the ship. So the ship sinks around him while he's strapped to this anti-aircraft gun firing, you know, high explosive anti-aircraft rounds into the sky at these aircraft, sinks with the ship underwater and everyone saw it. The tracers were coming up out of the water because he he was firing from, you know, 10, 15 feet below as the ship continued to sink and he was lost. So he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, which is, um, like you know, the highest military honour in the British uh, Commonwealth services. But the kid, he was 18 or 18 or 19. It's incredible. So that sister ship to Castlemaine, the Armadale, is identical in every way. And she's preserved in Williamstown. It was like a 20 minute drive from me. She's got triple expansion steam engines, like miniature. So it's like getting your into the ocean liner engine room, but in miniature, which is really cool. Beautifully preserved. She was kept on as a training ship after the Second World War, which is kind of why she's still around. So we're really lucky to have that ship. You read about the engagement with the Armadale. You go and visit the decks of the Castlemaine and you can just imagine it. It is like, it's really akin to reading a book like A Night to Remember or An Honesty of Glass about the Titanic and then getting to go and walk the decks of the Olympic. It's spooky. It's really, really spooky. You read in the, the engagement with Armadale about guys taking shelter in the, the, the bridge wing, like below the bridge. That area is like, it's tiny, you know, it's less than 20 feet wide and all these guys huddling there and you can stand there and imagine it. It's really, it's fascinating. So again, I've talked myself into a tangent, but uh, yes, museum ships tend to stay on, I'm uh, sorry, uh, training ships tend to stay on the longest and become museum ships. So if Olympic had become a training ship, maybe, but very rarely do ocean liners become uh, training ships. In fact, I can only think of it happening once with the uh, Majestic. Uh, Gosmit. Gosmit, hello. Great profile picture. Um, he's got the Olympic, by the looks of it, as a troop ship. Since you made a what-if on Titanic and Britannic now, will there be a what-if on Lusitania or Mauritania in the near future? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do something like that. I'd love to do um, a video on Lusitania, Mauritania, hypothetically speaking. I just wonder what it would be. What if Lusitania survived the First World War? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll think on that. That's a great idea. Um, open to any ideas from you guys. Uh, on what 
it would, you know, what it would be like. Like, what if Lusitania survived? What if Aquitania was the one sunk in the First World War? That would be a bummer because she was brand new, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll think on that. I'll, I, I definitely want to do more with the Mauritania because, I mean, you know, truly one of the most incredible ships of all time, um, right up there with, with the Aquitania and the others, uh, that I've been meaning to finish drawing for year, literally years. <laughs> and certain members of my server, hello, Alex, uh, frequently complain that I haven't finished the drawing. I'm working on it. Um, Jonathan Mitchell. Hello, Jonathan has very kindly donated $50, which is an incredible, again, I'm, I'm frequently blown away by the, um, the generosity of the ocean liner community. So I really appreciate it. Like every super chat, every little bit, um, directly contributes to my ability to make these videos. And in fact, I've made this my job now. Um, I left my, my corporate job uh, two or three weeks ago and I'm doing this full time. So I really, really appreciate you guys uh, supporting me because I love doing this. I'm fascinated in this. So yeah, every, every little uh, cent or every donation like this is goes a very long way. So thank you so much, truly. Jonathan says, good evening, Mike. Good evening, Jonathan. Uh, a couple of questions for you. What are your views on Olympics grand staircase being painted avocado green in the 1930s? Do you think they would have painted Britannic staircase if she survived into the 30s? That's a really good question. I know um, they like to create some kind of um, uh, unique atmosphere aboard each ship so that each ship fostered its own following. So um, Olympic and Titanic initially were, were identical, um, but Lusitania, Mauritania, and Aquitania were each very different. And by the 1920s and 1930s, it became very clear that to attract a tourist class passenger, which was this new generation of people who had money that they could spend on travel and holiday for the first time ever, um, that you needed to attract people in different ways. So just having a fleet of identical ships was probably not going to do it. You want to create some themes and have some fun so that people love the Britannic. Next time they might think, gee, you know, I, I loved traveling on the Britannic, but um, you know, I want to experience the Olympic because it's a little different. And to that end, Olympic had installed in the, in the, the her last refit, um, a suite, a series of suites called the colonial suites, uh, the colonial rooms that were each themed on what, one part of the colonies. And it was a little bit gaudy and kind of tacky, but, um, you know, created this idea of, you know, it's a themed, um, uh, crossing. It's a little more fun. I think they would have kept some kind of uh, distinction between Britannic and Olympic. I can imagine Britannic's Grand Staircase actually remaining unpainted because it was so much grander than Olympic's with that huge pipe organ that they they were planning on installing, which is wild. I mean, um, for, I don't, yeah, I actually can't think of another White Star ship or Highland Wolf built ship with anything like that. So Britannic was really something special. I, I can imagine them keeping that and therefore it cultivating um, a little bit more of a traditionalist following in the way that Aquitania being the grand old lady in the 1920s and 30s had those, you know, solid timber interiors and she really attracted this older money set. And I can imagine the Britannic doing the same thing. Whereas Olympic would have with her green interior and a little more deco maybe and the dance floor and everything have kept the, the younger, um, the younger set coming through. Uh, I can actually imagine if Britannic and Olympic, I, I forgot to mention this in the what if Britannic didn't sink video, booze cruises became a big thing when, you know, America instituted prohibition in the 20s and Berengaria, the uh, Cunard superliner that was previously German built, did these cruises with no destination where basically Americans could finally drink in public and they became known as booze cruises. Mauritania did the same thing. Uh, because of this, Berengaria earned her nickname the Bargain Area, <laughs> which I think is brilliant. Um, so there you go. What do I think of the Green Staircase? I don't know. kind of like it. I, am I going to get crucified for saying that? Maybe. They painted, for those uh, not totally au fait with this subject, they painted uh, Olympic's Grand Staircase, which was varnished oak, beautiful oak, uh, avocado green, which was a decision. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of like it. I don't know. It's, I like green. What can I say? Martin Pollitt has joined the Ocean Liner Designs 
YouTube membership program. Welcome aboard. Welcome to the crew. You will see some hilarious bloopers. And I'm sure if someone shares that clip of me uh, swearing earlier by accident, <laughs> I, I'm sure I will share it there as well. <laughs> That's still... Oh, that was so funny. It's funny because it worked as well. Like, if I didn't say anything, you, a lot of you probably would have just assumed that I meant to say that. Uh, Maritime History says, Hey, Mike, were there always two lookouts in the crow's nest at all times on board Titanic? Yes. On all ships, there is usually a two-man watch in the crow's nest. The, st <laughs> the stoned abbot says, Mike, show me the guitar. I have a, I have a G Gibson acoustic made in early 1912. That is very cool. Did you cry a little in, um, what was it? Uh, the Hateful Eight when Kurt Russell like absolutely destroyed that vintage guitar. It was like 1880s guitar that they meant to swap out for a prop when he smashes it over the wall and he accidentally destroyed the real thing. I cried a little. Um, there is a guitar back here. I can't really play that well, so I'm probably not going to. Maybe at some point. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll go and get it for you in a minute. OG Goji says, uh, well, hello there, Ocean Man. Hello, OG Goji. <laughs> Ocean Man, my unofficial nickname. Uh, la large Man. You've heard of Ocean Man. Now, here's Large Man. Hi, Mike. Would you consider a video about civilian careers and conversions to various World War II corvettes and frigates post-war? Man, some of you guys are mind readers. This is funny. There is this ship that is so, so funny. I'm doing a video this week on uh, my five worst ship makeovers. Like the, the five worst ones. I've done some of my five favorites. I'm going to do five of the worst. <laughs> One of them, <laughs> which you just have to, has to be seen to be believed, uh, was a Australian seaplane tender from the Second World War. Uh, that was <laughs> overhauled into a, a passenger ship named the Hellenic Prince after the Second World War. And it just has to be seen to be believed. It is so, so funny that this ever happened. That of all the ships from the Second World War that were built, that could perfectly fit the bill, that this line operates as an ocean liner, no less, as a migrant ship between Australia and Europe, uh, this this bizarre looking seaplane tender. You would not believe it unless you saw it. So go and Google the Hellenic Prince. I'm going to go into it uh, on my, on my video this weekend, but or this week. Very funny. We've got more uh, super chats coming in. Airwicker says Mauritania to when I will do it. I promise. Again, there's so many good ships to talk about and um, I do need to keep ship things coming in at the same time as I need to talk about uh, non uh, sh ship things. come Titanic things. I need to talk about Titanic things as well as other ships. So Titanic keeps a broader population of people interested. Mauritania too will be for the, you know, the real uh, ocean liner fans. So uh, real fans only, you know. Uh, Snow speeders and space shuttles. Again, 10 pounds. Thank you very much, Snow speeders. He says, love your video on Britannic. However, personally... I imagine she would be sent to help evacuate, yeah, Singapore in 1942, but was sunk by the Japanese Navy alongside HMS Repulse and Prince of Wales. That's a really cool end um, as well. Um, I love that alternate history idea. That's cool. Uh, yeah, in retrospect, I would have done something. I actually wanted to have it in the Pacific, but I, I wanted to highlight how miserable the conditions were for troops on these things in the Pacific because these ships just were not designed for operations where it's hot and they just became an oven. And so these men, like, you know, Queen Mary was carrying 16,000 men between eight and 16,000 men, you know, would sleep up on the deck and it just must've been a nightmare. So yeah, I wanted to kind of highlight that, that Britannic would have been boiling hot and miserable, like a giant, giant oven. And um, yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about that a little, I guess I could have talked about that uh, if she'd gone to the Pacific. I like your version better. I'm, I'm going to remake the video. Logan Huffgarden has given $2 and says, a generous donation. Uh, love your drawings. Thank you, Logan. Very much appreciated. Now, look. <laughs> I see some of you have looked up the Hellenic Prince because some of the comments are already hilarious. 
Hi, Mike. Uh, I've already looked up the hilarious... What, what, what on God's earth... This is from Sam Lamb. Okay, what on God's earth is the Hellenic Prince? It looks like a knife case. <laughs> it does. It looks like a kitchen knife. I don't even know how to describe that. Um, Kit10k says, Hey, Mike, I was a little late to the live stream today because I just came from meeting Tom Linsky. I bought him some RC boats he bought off me and I just got back to my hotel. Well, welcome. Welcome, Kit. Um, hope Tom's doing all right. Tom is an old friend of the channel. Uh, he is a another YouTuber. He goes by Part-Time Explorer on YouTube. And um, I'm glad he's doing all right. That's cool. RC boats. That's exciting. Now, look, um, it's already been a little over an hour. And um, I was meant to do a presentation of uh, of state library photographs. So I might do this uh, state library thing for about 15 minutes. And then what I want to do just before we finish at half past is um, show you some community made models that uh, a couple of my members have been making. So a couple of uh, Ocean Liner Designs crew members, super, super talented. And um, I'm sure they're all talented in different ways. But these guys just happen to be brilliant at making 3D models and Minecraft models of different ships and lighthouses and all kinds of things. So I was going to show a couple off um, really, really quickly because I'm pretty impressed by these uh, by these models. I have a lot of patience, but I do not have the patience for 3D modeling or Minecraft modeling. Mm. All right. Why don't we um, have a quick look at some ship pictures? What do you guys think? Um, the State Library of Victoria is interesting because they have this collection of photos and I, I talked about this briefly on my last live stream where in the for, like for a crazy amount of time like from the 20s through to the 60s there was this one maritime photographer in Melbourne who captured as many arrivals and departures of ocean liners as he could and they are stunning and it looks like he was using some kind of like um, old fashioned glass plate camera to get these because the color of the sky and the and the sea kind of makes me think that this is a um an earlier type of camera and just the 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 amount of detail you can get out of these photographs is incredible that really only glass old glass plate photo cameras could really get so i assume these are old cameras this is the wonganella uh, which i've mentioned in a previous live stream um, but she was a Harland and Wolf built motor ship and you can kind of tell because she's got those flat squat funnels that Harland and Wolf really loved um, implementing tragically was scrapped uh, really late you know like in the if not the it was like the 70s or 80s I think and they sh she should have been kept you know that that is really sad but she, a beautiful looking ship and if you want to look her up there's her name conveniently spelled out for you w-a-n-g-a-n wonganella so she was designed to operate between New Zealand and Australia. That is a beautiful photograph. Um, another thing that um, crops up fairly often in this photo archive are the Jubilee class uh, ocean liners, which are um, white star lines offering to operate between Liverpool and Australia. So these ships, the original white star line, which was the ship that Thomas Ismay bought in the late uh, 1800s, was called the Oceanic um, I don't think it was called, maybe it was called the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company. But my, my understanding was that the Oceanic refers perhaps to Oceania, um, Australia, because the original White Star Line made their fortune in Australia, in the Australian trade, because in Australia there was a gold rush, just like in California uh, in the 1800s. And so a lot of people needed to come out here very, very quickly. None of, well, not many of them, um, convicts. <laughs> so uh, there needed to be a regular service. And the White Star Line operated that service, went defunct, was bought, the name and the house flag were bought by Thomas Ismay, and that's how we got the White Star Line that we know and love today. But to reinstitute the Australian service, Thomas Ismay and Harland and Wolfe um, went about building a, a series of ships. Uh, there were five of these. They were called the Jubilee class. The first, I think, went into service in about 1899, um, and the last two went into service about two or three years later on. And um, there were combination cargo passenger ships. You can tell they were part cargo ship because of the amount of masts uh, and cargo handling equipment everywhere. So they weren't particularly pretty, I suppose, um, but very, very Harland and Wolf. There are a lot of design flourishes here that you just know 
Um, you see that picture there? That photo of the stern, you see that, and you just know that that is a Harlan and Wolf ship. That is a white star line Harlan and Wolf built ocean liner because that could be the stern from any of their any of their ships. They they use the the same design stylings very very often. Um, beautiful ships, stunning photographs as well. These ones. Um, here's another one. So this is one of those ships, the Persic. A um, couple of interesting things going on here. Uh, the first is right up here at the very tip of the bow. You can see that there is a canvas awning type structure uh, set up here. Um, typically in fairly treacherous waters uh, or in fog, this area or this part of a ship was crewed and it was called the Head of Eyes. And that refers back to the old days of sailing where the head or the toilet of the ship, I believe, was very far forward on the bow, just like this. Um, but it's obviously an optimal uh, viewpoint because you can see things from lower down um, and directly in front of the, the crow's nest, which is back here on the foremast. The crow's nest here is not very high off the ground. In fact, I am six foot five. I'm pretty sure I could just reach up from the deck and ring that bell. <laughs> not quite. Um, so to protect those uh, crew members and anybody operating any of the machinery down here on the forecastle deck, they would erect canvas um, and stretch it across here. And there are pictures of Olympic with this as well to, you know, stop some of the sea spray and deflect it. Some other ocean liner builders got wise and actually built this area up um, as on the Lusitania and the Mauritania and the Queen Mary and the Mauritania too. So when I say some ocean liner manufacturers, I mean mainly Cunard, um, figured out that, hey, we should probably put a little structure there to make it, you know, a little better. But nope, White Star Line just continued deploying canvas and um, another interesting little structure just after this you might just see these long beams just uh either side of the anchor crane this is to rig more canvas so in the hot sun in the indian ocean and the south pacific and the waters of australia uh, operating the machinery on deck here would not be a very fun job so early liners operating in those waters would frequently have these big basically circus tent, you know, um, skeletons that you could just rig up canvas on top of and create like a little uh, roof to protect from the sun. So you see that all the time on any ship designed to operate uh, anywhere where it's hot. So P&O ships always had those awning structures. And looking further aft, you can see um, on the bridge here, there is a little platform with a, uh, with a Morse um, telegraph. So this was designed to signal ships in the days before wireless communication because this ship ended service before wireless was a thing. Um, so it seems kind of funny to have a, a ship as kind of modern looking as this without any kind of, of wireless uh, technology. But I'm sure it was retroactively fitted. What kind of flags have we got flying here? Ah, here we go. Um, that is the Australian flag. You can just make out the uh the star here on the flag and um, those of you that watched my recent ship flag video titanic flag video know that that is a sign of respect when entering a foreign port that you fly that country's flag and even though australia was part of the uh the commonwealth they they would fly the australian flag which i think is really cool um i don't know i like these I like these photographs. These are great. You can just get a lot of detail and figure out how these ships were were operated, you know? Um, that's a little interesting thing there. You see one of those portholes is shaped a little differently. It's got a, a scoop. Um, that's literally what it is. It's a air scoop. And in the days before air conditioning, uh -huh, you had to get air into your ship whatever way possible. So there were these things that were basically, um, they look like a teaspoon shaped scoop fitted perfectly to the porthole that you could actually screw in and direct to whatever way the wind was blowing so you could get a fresh breeze into your porthole when it was hot at night and that's what that is there is one installed there and I'm, I'm pretty sure they crop up later on because for the longest time into the 1960s they still used air scoops to get to get air into ships keep an eye out for them we'll see if there's any more um this is a stunning photograph of one of the strath ships um i think this is the strath eden if I had to guess, 
Ah, that's convenient. There is a... Good thing I got that right, because that would have been embarrassing. Um, beautiful ship. Is that not a just a stunning looking liner? Don't you guys think? I love it. That's fantastic. Some, someone just said in the comments, like they're, they're shocked that I'm six foot five. Yeah, I guess no one's... You can't really tell when I'm sitting down. I, in my flag video, I put myself a scale next to one of the flags and the, the flag is six foot tall and I'm, you know, in the picture, I'm like five inches above that. And someone said, oh, I think you've got your scaling off. You know, like you're way taller than the flag. And it's like, oh, I, I know. <laughs> um, before I talk about the Strathedon, I did promise I'd tell you guys this. I uh, fell down the stairs at the Sydney Maritime Museum. I... I, I stupidly had my phone out i was walking down the stairs and uh yeah missed the bottom step and fell in front of one of my friends onto my face but i put my hand out to stop myself beforehand and i've just this week uh after two or three weeks since regained function of my left hand which is great because now i can eat food like a normal person instead of stabbing it like tarzan so there you go can we get an F in the chat for my for my wrist? That'd be great. Um, Charles Burns said that that ship did have wireless antenna. Yeah, so this she would have been retroactively fitted. So um, here you can see that, yeah, there is an antenna set up here. Just you've got in this picture, you can see the, the dipole, which is the, the long rod here separating the two antenna lines. And you can tell it's a wireless antenna and that this line is electrified because either side of that dipole is um, the insulators. So you can see those little black beads there. They essentially, I think they would have been ceramic um, and they would have interrupted, basically ended the, the wire so that it doesn't, nothing electrical or electrified touches any of the steel of the ship. Now, the top part of the mast of the ship here is actually wood. It's the bottom part that was made out of made out of steel plating. Um, it doesn't matter though. You can't have anything electrified touching anything that is not electrified. So, yeah, wherever there's um, these things, you know those little black beads. You know that's an electrified line. So in this case, it's a it's a wireless uh, antenna. But when they first entered service, they did not have them. They only had their semaphore telegraph and their flags. So yes, uh, back to Strathedon. Uh, there we go. There are there are getting Fs in the chat now for my wrist. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. That's great. That's fantastic. Nerdy Poston says, everybody keep your women away from Mike. He's over six foot Australian, a ship nerd and artist. He's a, he's a, has a famous father and has a relatively successful life. A relatively, I've got a relatively successful life. It's official. <laughs> that is very exciting. Thank you. Um, so just, yeah, quick point on the, um, on the Strathedon. Actually, I, I guess this will have to be my last picture. Cause I still wanted to show you guys those, um, those beautiful 3d models by my community. So I'll just go over this one real quick. Um, Strathedon was the natural evolution of, um, the previous Strath ships, um, the Strath Neva and the Strath Ed, which were the first two near identical sisters. In fact, more more identical even than perhaps Olympic and Titanic. Sometimes it's almost impossible to tell them apart. The next along was Strathmore, which was very different. Strathnava and Strathaird were designed and built with three funnels. Strathmore, they had enlarged the, the, the design. They had improved it a little. And Vickers Armstrong, who built these ships, had really uh, perfected this, this style of ship, which was really, really popular on the Australia run. Orient Line built ships just like this through Vickers as well. And sometimes those the, the two lines, it's hard to tell the ships apart. But you can tell this was designed to operate on the Australia run because it's got so many promenades. And um, I've always thought that this was because you want to give passengers the sense that they can walk wherever they want um, and as much as possible because the voyage is so much longer than a transatlantic crossing. So... Um, often as in the case with the Oriana. So this is a, well, I call it a gallery stern. I don't know if that's the, the correct terminology, but where you've got all of these um, decks, like a layer cake of promenades, Oriana 
basically it was one of the last ships to feature this, but at, had it to the next level. You know, she had like this much actual stern and then dozens of promenades on top, essentially. And uh, yeah, this is this is where it all kind of began. So Strath Eden was um, one of the last of the series, but my goodness, she was beautiful. Interestingly, you can see them flying. Um, what I think is the Red Ensign uh, from the main mast here at the back, just below the, the Piedo flag, because the Ensign is not flying from the Jack Staff at the stern, you can see. There's nothing there. So in this case, it looks like they are flying it from the mast, which is kind of cool. And further up here, we have the Australian flag as a, uh, uh, you know, a courtesy. And again, you guys can tell that this is part of an antenna structure because there are big insulators just sitting right there. So this is some kind of uh, wireless arrangement, clearly. So there you go. Beautiful photographs. Um, we'll continue our, um, our, our kind of look through the, uh, the archives of the Australian or Victorian State Library into the future. We're getting near the end of the stream and I haven't yet been able to show off uh, the beautiful models of my community. So I think I might do that real quick and um, just show you some of the things that my, um, my, my community members have been making because they're just really, really impressive. And I just wanted to give them all a quick shout out and, um, and give them the chance to show off. And uh, I think what we'll do the next stream is we'll open it up and say, look, if you have drawn a ship, if you've built a 3D model, if you have built an actual model of a ship, I'll set up an email address. You can send a picture through and maybe we'll, uh, we'll go through them all. So why don't we have a quick look? Let's see if this works. Yes, there we go. Sorry, the cropping's a little bit funny on this. Um, so forgive me. Maybe if I like blow this out a little bit more. Yeah, not really. All right, that'll have to do. Um, this is by Back Out and Join. He's a fairly uh, popular and successful Minecraft modeler. Um, he's also an Ocean Liner Designs patron. And he works alongside another Ocean Liner Designs patron called Skittery Fiber to make these incredible ship models on uh, Minecraft and then renders them like this. So here we've got the two sisters, uh, well, really running mates. I don't know that they were sister ships because they're so different. We have Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. And again, I know the Queen Mary was like something like 3 million blocks off the top of my head and Queen Elizabeth must have been similar or more. Um, but what an incredible effort and how beautiful this is. Like to think that this is made up of, of boxes, essentially made up of blocks is really mind blowing. But I know these guys work on this like it's a full time job. And so I just wanted to highlight this. We'll, we'll see more of back out and join stuff in a minute, possibly on the next one. At the moment, um, they've been working a little bit on the Olympic and the Titanic, which is hilarious because um, I mentioned earlier that some people say, why do you make so many videos about the Olympic and the Titanic? Well, Back Out and Join is one of those people who frequently complains that I make too many videos about the Titanic. <laughs> um, so he and Skittery Fiber, look, fair play. They, uh, they recognize that these ships are, are important, so they wanted to make them as well. And uh, these are just beautiful models. There's something really satisfying about seeing the two sister ships here passing each other mid-ocean, which is really cool. Um, the detail on the Olympic is is spot on, you know. Um, you can just walk the decks and really get a sense of the scale of these ships. Um, they've even gone so far as to like keep an eye out for details like the... Um, you can just see these curved looking structures kind of in the middle of the screen here. I'll like zoom right in on one so you know what I'm talking about. So that thing there um, was a staircase cover for the stairs that led down from the, the bridge, the officer's area of the bridge um, down to a deck below. And on essentially they, they were built with a weather cover. So an Olympic and Titanic, sorry, on Olympic, Olympic was built with this um, curved structure to, to cover it from the rain. But it must've just been annoying because they cut it off on Titanic. So when Olympic was introduced, she had them, they cut them off. Um, I think Titanic originally, while she was very early on in her construction, had the, the whole thing and they, they halved it and, and cut it off because they just said, look, it's, probably you can imagine their crew had to duck to get down the staircases and they just thought, you know what, we, we actually don't need this. It's really not a problem. Bearing in mind, ships had only recently um, got 
uh, covers on their bridges. It was a real British naval thing to just be out in the elements and out in the coal uh, as much as possible. And uh, British warships and destroyers, especially into the Second World War, didn't have covered bridges, which is incredible to me. Um, that was at corvettes and all these warships just had open top bridges, which is hilarious. So anyway, so there you go. Um, Olympic and Titanic. Um, what have we got next? Titanic um, being built, which I think is real cool. Uh, this is a beautiful render because it shows that back out and join. Um, sorry, this is the Olympic. <laughs> Uh, I need a, I need another coffee. You can tell it's the Olympic because she's got this open uh, promenade deck, and it says Olympic on the front of the ship. Now, look, this may be um, difficult to comprehend. Here's here's a tip: if you can't figure out what ship it is, just look at the front where they have the name. <laughs> um, that's brilliant. What this shows, though, is that back out and join and skittery fiber have made the Thompson Graving Dock, where uh, Harlem Wolf built so many of their ships. And not only the Thompson Graving Dock, but also the giant floating crane that was used to manufacture these ships. So it was a German crane, um, and it was itself a piece of engineering art. And uh, they've built that as well, which is great. I've actually stood uh, just over here um, on those mountains. Um, they're not that big, I don't recall. I don't think that they're like that big in real life. Um, but you can stand at the top of a mountain at um, Belfast Castle and look out over Belfast Lock and the mouth of the River Lagan. And um, you would have seen Olympic steaming out. You would have had this unbelievable view from over there of these ships being built and sailing. And it's if you, if you go to Belfast, I 100% would recommend going up and standing on on, at, at Belfast Castle because you just get such a beautiful, beautiful view. People are quoting my... Uh, oh, people are really bullying me in the comments right now. Mike, swearing, switching ships. Oh, my goodness. Mike walked straight into that switch. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's not my, it's not my morning. Look that beep up. <laughs> We're going to get that on a t-shirt. That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, what do we got next? Um, ooh, this is cool. Okay, so here we have a uh, German heavy cruiser from the Second World War. This is another back out and join special. It was back out and join is a uh, bit of a Kriegsmarine nerd, German Navy, and uh, his other alias is Prinz Eugen. And that gives you a little bit of a clue as to what ship this is, because it is his favorite German heavy cruiser, the German cruiser Prinz Eugen, famously escorted Bismarck during Operation Rhinobung. Uh, in May 1941 um, and was actually engaged first in the famous um, gun battle with um, Hood and I think it was the Prince of Wales because it kind of looks like Bismarck from a distance and um, yeah, she was mistaken for Bismarck and they, they fired on this ship first and then switched to, uh, to Bismarck. But again, just a beautiful model and uh, actually a very, very pretty looking ship. I think the Germans... Uh, and the Japanese in the Second World War had some of the most beautiful looking cruisers. Uh, just very sleek and elegant. Not a lot of freeboard, as you can see. And a very, very slight shear. Freeboard being the distance from the water to the top of the deck. So I'm fairly certain these ships would have been um, very wet ships. You know, they would have been taking on, especially in the North Sea and in the Atlantic, huge amounts of spray and, and water. So... Um, any of those ships with low, very low freeboard warships would have been taking on quite a bit of water uh, as they sailed. Now, um, moving on from Back Out and Join and Skittery Fiber's beautiful work, we have uh, some renders from another Ocean Liner Designs patron crew member named Alex, uh, who is a huge fan of the Olympic class and ships in general. Um, so Jake, just to go back to Jake, Jake says, are these models available to download anyway? They absolutely are. Um, just have a quick look at, uh, back out and join on, um, on Google. If you look up back out and join, uh, Minecraft ships, you'll be able to, uh, to download some. There's a bot commenting in the comments and I actually can't, uh, delete those right now. Unfortunately, for some reason, my software is freaking out on me. So I'm sorry, guys, I'm gonna have to get a, uh, a moderator in here next time. I actually can't delete that comment. That's all right. We're going to wrap up in a minute anyway. Um, I just wanted to show off Alex's work real quick. This is a 3D model or a Minecraft model 
of the earliest design of the Olympic class. And you can tell straight off the bat because it is lacking a aft main mast. You can see that there is no second mast on the ship. And the funnels are way, way, way taller. Um, this was based on the Design D concept that was introduced in 1909. And um, you can see that the ship looked a little different. This is a pretty cool model. This is a great view because you can see how how different um, the Olympic class would have looked. That the wireless antenna was probably slung between the first two funnels. Um, the lifeboat arrangement was super wacky. They were all kept at the towards the stern. Um, they had radial davits. They hadn't yet, I don't think, invested in the well and uh, well and quadrant davits. And um, there was just a lot of promenade going on. So yeah, this was a, a concept of what the Olympic class probably would have looked like. I'm just watching the, the comments going on in the background, uh, people freaking out about the bot. I'm sorry about the bot. I can't do anything about it. I can't delete it right now. But we are just minutes away from wrapping up. Um, Alex has done interiors of this model as well. I just wanted to show off uh, this beautiful exterior shot. While I've got that up, I just wanted to broach a quick question by Crazy Doctor Who, who says, what about the third funnel version? Um, I don't think that a third funnel or a three funnel Olympic class design was ever seriously considered because they knew early on that four funnel ships had become all the, all the rage. They symbolize real power and, and speed. So three funnels was the way to go. Four funnels was the way to go rather. So I'm distracted by people now spamming in the, uh, in the comment section. So I don't truly think a three funnel Olympic class design really made it. It was never presented to the white star line. Um, and I think the whole idea of a three funnel Olympic class is based on an artist's representation that ran in the newspaper. That was it. I don't even know that it was ever even seriously made it to the drawing board. Uh, and look, as the last one, this is a really cool thing um, by Andy Arts. Uh, this is another Ocean Liner Designs patron. And um, what's really cool about Andy is that he does 3D modeling. Um, proper 3D modeling um, with Blender. And he makes beautiful stuff. His thing is really uh, lighthouses, as you can see here. So this is a uh, Fresnel lens. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from a lighthouse. And what's amazing about this is he he does these and they look photorealistic once he's, once he's made them, you know. So I think I just wanted to show this off because... It's beautiful. Oh yeah, I can finally, finally delete the guy who's been spamming. I just figured out a way to do it. Yes, okay, that should have done it. There we go, goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to show this off because it looks like a photograph. You know what I mean? How cool is that? So Andy, well done. I just wanted to give you a quick mention. He did send me a few more things. I'll show them off next stream um, because this was the, the only image I grabbed from his. Um, but yeah, super, super talented. You'll be seeing more of Andy's stuff in the future. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks so much for, for sharing that one. I love that everyone in the comments is going, wow, that's a, that's a model? <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? How cool. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining the live stream today. It's been a lot of fun. Sorry about the spam. I um, I will get a, uh, a moderator in here next time. I thought that we could get away with it, but uh, clearly not. No, I'll invest in that. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. And let's do this again sometime in the near future. I'm going to do one of these about once a month. So we'll talk more ships then. Leave some questions in the comments if you like. If I didn't get to answer them, I'll see if I can get around to doing it. But thank you so much for joining. As always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time. Bye.